Greetings, ladies and mantle gents, and welcome to this latest edition of Tales from Outer space. space. And as always, I hope that you enjoy. Retreat Hull, Chapter 16, Part 3. Do you think this looks better over the left shoulder or the right one? Mother asked, posing for Samson. I think you should go with the chartreuse one, Samson said. Plump it out a little better. Over your chest, uh, like your boobs. Ah, told you, Jenna hates chartreuse. Mella said, bluffing out the toga-like sheet of cloth. Reminds me of something she threw up when she was a kid. Well, uh, no loss then. Samson threw his hands up, shaking his head. All right, now give me a runway. Mella turned around and walked away, and then turned back and stalked towards Samson. Hmm, yeah, not, not twelve. No. And pose. Uh, oh, work, work, baby, work it. Uh, I got smacked that ass. He turned to one of the Kishmen who had stopped to watch them. What do you think, right shoulder? The man gave him a sidelong glance, shrugging with his ears. Yeah, that's what I thought, Samson said, nodding. He turned back to Miller. Yeah, no, Steve here says the right shoulder is terrible. You need to go with the left, but maybe try draping it over and twisting it back over your right shoulder. Miller, walking back over, carefully unwrapping the toga. Jenna's gonna love this, he paused, then dug into his pocket, putting his phone out a moment after Samson pulled out his... They exchanged a glance. Then Miller stripped off the toga. How much? Samson asked the merchant. He quickly counted out the first offer as Miller stuffed the toga into his backpack. Probably time to quit anyway. Our bags are full to bursting. Ready? Samson asked as Miller swung a pack onto his back. Yeah, he said, his business face falling back into place. Let's roll then, Samson said, turning to lead the way back out the market. They were near the edge of the square when he spotted the other group of marines. Hey, there's Dubois. Dubois! He waved, catching their attention. They met the other four marines halfway. Any ideas on what's up? Edison asked. Nope, Miller said. You? Dubois shook his head. Not a clue. But it probably isn't good. He turned and led the way out of the town. You guys seen Kowalski's group? Not since uh, we split. You? Nope. Hopefully you'll run into him on the way. The door burst open and Gomez stormed in, blouse and hat, pants half buckled, shirt half tucked in. The woman on top of Kowalski squeaked in surprise, but he kept his hands in place and she kept riding. Go feck your own, Kowalski shouted and groaned. Fecking hell, man! Gomez dropped his blouse on the stool and stalked over to pick up a naked woman straight off Kowalski. She meeped in surprise and then indignation as she was unceremoniously dumped to the side. Dude, what the feck? Kowalski sat up, not even trying to cover himself, ready to deck the younger marine. Check your fucking phone, Gomez said, pointing at Kowalski's pants. Shields is in trouble, big time. Fuck! Kowalski yelled, throwing himself back against the bed in frustration. After a heavy sigh, he stood up and started throwing his pants on. Sorry, babe. He grabbed the blouse and backpack, feeling the weight of the coin purse inside. Right, always gotta pay the ladies. He pulled one out and gave it a heft. How much did she say she was charging? One of these crown things? Seven? Ah, feck it. It only cost me 15 bucks for over 50 of them. He shrugged and tossed the entire sack of coins at her. Keep the change. She yipped in surprise at the unexpected throw, then delight as he hopped out of the room, stuffing his feet into his boots. Radford stormed through the town. Most Kishman actively jumped out of her way. Following the shopkeeper's directions, she quickly reached the edge of town bringing the camps between it and the walls into view. The army camp was clearly marked and contained, but the refugee camps were scattered and far less orderly. Clusters of tents had been set up just about in any bare patch of dirt that could hold them. Just outside the town, next to one of such cluster, sat two trucks with several marines passing out MREs and sacks of rice to an orderly line of refugees. The officer supervising the operation turned to her approach, as she recognized First Lieutenant Washbourne, Echo Company supply officer. Ma'am, she said, snopping and snapping a salute. Sergeant Bradford, she said, returning it. Where's your battle buddy? I'm trying to find him, ma'am. He glanced at the Marines. Can I borrow two of your riflemen, ma'am? Washbourne sighed. What stupid crap did Kowalski get up to now? It's not Kowalski, ma'am. A yacht's been detained. Don't know why, she grimaced. I'm hoping it's just a misunderstanding. But I've got a bad feeling, and, uh, I'd rather be safe than sorry. And ma'am, if I could call this up the chain. She raised an eyebrow and nodded. Brickle, Centelli, 
She called over her shoulder. Go over with Sergeant Bradford. She turned back. I'll get on the horn with Mayers and Captain Spader. Try to get them back. Or at least keep them from doing anything stupid. But don't do anything stupid yourself, Sergeant. Aye, aye, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. She looked at a new backup. Let's go. Turning away from the truck, she saw the rest of Second Squad rolling up from the town. She waited for them to catch up. On me, she said, turning and continuing down the road. Kowalski and Dubois eyed the extra marines in full battle rattle before exchanging a glance, but they all fell in behind her. Bradford quickly brought them up to speed as they approached the gambling camp, and they all settled into a loose formation behind her as they marched up to the sentry at the main entrance. Glancing nervously at the squad of humans rolling up on his post, the young Keshman nervously gripped his pike. He was brown and cream-colored, and his short, wide snout more looked like a cougar than a fox. Do you understand English? Bradford asked, marching right up in front of him. She noted the lack of rank insignia on his uniform. Piker, their equivalent of private. Yeah, yes, I, I, uh, is that what you're speaking? He was rather shorter than Ren, and had a tilt to his head up to meet her eyes. Good, an artificer attached to my unit was recently detained by several soldiers of the royal host. We was brought through here. I, uh, what, w what did he look like? Bitch Black, he's from Yenta. Well, I, I, I don't know any artificer passing through recently. Most of them will, will get what rallied we can send back to the main army. He straightened, trying to look intimidating. I can't say beyond that. I'm not supposed to talk to the host business with anyone not sworn to the king. Listen here, Piker, she said, getting right in his face, practically touching his snout with her nose. One of my men is missing. He was last seen being detained by soldiers from the royal host. She spoke slowly, emphasizing each word. Was he brought through here? I, uh, I don't know if he was an artificer. And I'm not supposed to talk. I'll take that as a yes then. She turned away from the sentry. Come on, she said, stepping into the camp. Wait, you can't just... <clears throat> the sentry's pike glided to the ground, followed a moment later by the sentry as he stumbled back from Kowalski's heavy shoulder check. Bradford didn't even look back as she and her squad into the camp. Rin's head ached, but that was the least of his concerns. He glared at Kalai as his hands were unbound and his uniform blouse and shirt were stripped from him. They were left a gag tied around his snout, holding his mouth shut. They had originally tied a gag in his mouth until he had started to chew through it. Though he recognized some of them, none of the soldiers around him were from his column and several were new faces that he hadn't seen in the line before. Kalei had his backpack and was putting things out, the dress uniform that he had reacquired, some snacks, a couple of human trade goods that he hadn't betted away yet, his coin pouch. Ren's ears snapped up as Kalei pulled out his mother's wedding bands, examined them, and with a flick of his ears, tucked them into his cheek. Growling, Rin dropped his shoulder and barreled past the soldier, bringing his hands back together to rebind them. The unexpected charge sent the man tumbling to the ground, but the soldier on Rin's other side grabbed his arm and held him back. With another growl, Rin turned, grabbed the man's arm, and he tried to pull Rin into a grapple. With a twist of his hips he learned from the marines, Rin threw him off balance, and a sharp strike broke his arm with a loud pop. The man fell to the ground, screaming as two more soldiers barreled into Rin, tackling him to the ground. A jab to the nose sent one stumbling back, leaving Rin's hands free to grab the other's head. Rin felt a bit of an electric tingle as he zapped his skull. The soldier got out half a grunt as he jerked before falling limp. He was still alive. Rin didn't want to kill anyone, but he was done playing around. He shoved the unconscious man off of him and scrambled to his feet, but four more soldiers tackled him from behind. He tried to get another zap in, but they dragged him back to the ground. He felt something in his ribs from the sharp jab and curled into a ball as they pummeled him with kicks and punches. That's enough, Kalei's voice shouted. Get him up and keep his hands bound. The weight of bodies pressing him lightened, and he was hauled off his feet. The rough rope was quickly tied around his wrists and hands and cinched tight enough to immediately start cutting off circulation. Hold him over there. Where he belongs. Rin's hands were tugged to his left as he stumbled from the jab to the back. He pulled him into a cleared area where a crowd had already formed and up onto a raised platform. He received several jabs and a few kicks as they untied his hands, 
then strung him between two beams of a frame that stood atop it. One of his soldiers spat at him. Another soldier hauled a drum over to the front of the platform and upended it, before stepping aside and snapping to attention. An officer with night captain's insignia strode up and sat down on it. That's night gallant Leshen. He's like blind captain, not the line commander. Did night captain Ayan die in the battle? He must have. You're being relieved. A steward walked up with the tea tray. He handed it to the soldier who brought the drum, who held it while he poured the cup of tea. What are the charges, Pike Master? Leshen asked, receiving a teacup and plate from his steward. Calais, the Pike Master's second, stepped forward, holding up a sheet of parchment. Second artificer in a yacht, charged with dereliction, desertion, and cowardice in the face of the enemy. And what evidence do you have of those charges? Leshen sipped his tea. He was found in Yesseray, a known peddler of items stolen from the royal host, in a stolen uniform. He was perusing items looted during the retreat, and likely pouring off more of the same. He has been absent since the retreat, even though word has been spread through our line has regrouped here, and all the soldiers were to rally here for muster. His name has been posted on all four of the lists of the missing, presumed dead since the second day of the retreat, yet he has not come forward to correct them at all that time. Lastly, when confronted, he resisted arrest, broke Pikeman Assen's arms, and nearly killed Dirk Pike Kian with a natural ship shock burst. Leshen frowned. A shame to lose such a talented artificer, especially when our numbers are so depleted. He sipped his tea, but uh, the evidence is clear, and an example must be made. Uh, hang him. The took another sip of his tea. Shouts and jeers erupted from the crowd. Rin tried to object, but a hood and shoved over his head. Several hands grabbed his arms, and he was untied from the posts. He fought, struggling against his captors, until a fist to the groin deflated him. He fell to his knees, his mind reeling in pain. As his hands were bound behind his back, a noose was strung around his neck. He was hauled back to his feet, as much by the noose as by his hands gripping him. You'll be dancing with all the way to the guards below, you filthy coward! Kike Master Crone whispered in his ear as he stood on tiptoe, gasping for breath. No, 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 he desperately tried to get a shape spell to cut his bonds, but he couldn't see, and his hands were already numb. He couldn't have the manor just light them on fire and burn through the ropes before his hands were reduced to charred stumps. Today is a terrible day to die, he despaired, seeing no hope for survival. Until the deafening roar, three gunshots cut over the crowd. His eyes lit with renewed hope under the hood when he heard the sweet heaven-sent words of the Marine Corps Sergeant Jamie Alice Bradford in full fury. And what the fuck is going on here? We are dispensing justice to a deserter, the Gandon officer said, giving her a withering glare and a dismissive flick of his ear, still holding his teacup and saucer. Bradford had only been a sergeant for a few short weeks, but she was a daughter of a 30-year sergeant major, who was the son of a 30-year sergeant major, who was the son of a 20-year gunnery sergeant who stormed the beaches of Iowa Jima. She channeled every ounce of anger into the lineage as she lowered her borrowed sidearm and glared right back. The fuck are you? I beg your pardon, the officer frowned at her, glancing across her uniform. Soldier! Sergeant, sir! And I did not stutter! She thrust her free hand to point at Run. He is no deserter. He is braver man than any of you standing here! She glared across the gathered crowd, then turned back to the officer. When we charged in to save your asses from the rout, when all of the rest of you had run away and left him to die, my squad found second artificer, Yacht, still on the front line, standing toe to toe with a fucking jam blade. She took a breath as a murmur of disbelief rolled through the crowd. When we threw the owls back on the heels and the rest of your army held in place, he alone out of your entire fucking army charged forward with us. He saved my entire battalion from an elven ambush that day. She glared at the cashman, who had read the charges, recognized the distinctive stripe pattern that she had seen back in the shop. He didn't join you here because he never retreated. He joined up with my squad because you were all gone. 
He thought you were all dead, and he had nowhere else to go. She turned back to the officer. He was assigned to my squad by your supreme commander. He joined us in the attack on the elves' base camp and saved us all again when the elves counterattacked. He charged a goddamn mage tower with us, shielding us long enough to get javelins inside the shield bubble and take it out. He's been training with us for the rest of the artifices, sent two developed joint tactics with us ever since. She glared at the officer, daring him to try her. If he were a marine, he would have earned a goddamn medal of honor. And you jerks are trying to hang him for fucking desertion. The Kishman officer met her gaze, his chin raised, her ears swept back in the precise angle. She hefted a pistol. If you don't cut him free right goddamn now, I'll put a fucking bullet between your eyes. The officer narrowed his eyes and his ears swept low. He had barely moved a muscle otherwise. Now you're threatening me, Sergeant. I don't answer to you, sir. And you're trying to murder one of my men as we speak. She jabbed her free hand at the executioner who was casually leaning on the rope strung around Rin's neck. It was drawn tight over the frame, and he was nearly lifted off his toes. I'll threaten whomever the hell I goddamn please. She raised the pistol, pointing it at the officer. Behind her, the squad had fanned out and was doing their best to look mean and nasty. Things would go bad if they were swarmed, but they were putting up a best show, and she loved them for it. The officer continued to stare at her, unflinching through narrowed eyes. And do you have any proof of your claims? Proof? You want proof? She reached up with a free hand and scrapped open her breast pocket. Please, please tell me I transferred it to this uniform. Please let it be there. Yes! She went silent thanks to her neurotic habit of always moving anything in certain pockets into whatever uniform she wore. She yanked a folded piece of paper out of her pocket. Here is your proof! She held it out, a copy of his orders attaching him to my squad, signed by Lord General Yangri himself. The officer flicked an ear at an aide, and the Kishman cautiously walked over to take the paper. Slack that rope, Pike Master, he called, blaring at the executioner. I've told you before, there'll be no jig dancing on this line. The executioner glumly swept his ears back and released the rope. She heard Rin take a desperate gasp of air and drop back to his heels. The aide carefully unfolded the paper and started reading it. His eyes narrowed and then shot up wide as his ears perked upright in alarm. He turned and quickly passed it to the officer. He has a copy in his own pocket of his blouse, she spat, which you would have seen if you just let him speak. The officer's ears perked up as he read the paper, then swept low. Hmm. It would seem that an apology is in order. He flicked his ears out and back, cut him loose. The executioner hesitated and he turned to glare at him. Don't get creative, Yeyesh. Cut him free. Yeyesh twitched his ears back and grumbled, but obediently untied the rope around Rin's wrists. No sooner were his hands free than he was ripping a noose from his neck, followed by the hood. Blinking in daylight, he stumbled off the platform and towards the marines who quickly surrounded him. Radford lowered the pistol and returned it to the marine that she had borrowed it from. And his stuff... The officer looked up at the striped Kishman and flicked an imperative ear at him. He slouched and walked away, and the officer turned back to Bradford. My apologies, Sergeant. We received a tip that we might find a deserter slinking around to pawn shops. It would seem that the tip was in error. I think you can safely shoot the bastards as unreliable, sir. She gave a snort and flicked his ears up in amusement. The striped Kishman returned and handed Kimber a bundle of was Rin's blouse, undershirt, and shoulder bag. Rin broke away from Dubois, who was holding him up, and stumbled over to desperately paw through it. Where are the bands? He looked up at the striped Kishman. Where are my mother's wedding bands? Second Pike Kaloi, the officer growled, glaring at him. Give him his things. The striped Kishman sheepishly lowered his ears. He pulled a small bundle from the inside of his tunic and handed it to Rin. Rin grabbed the bundle, pulling the cloth away and urgently inspecting the gold wristbands before clutching them to his chest and falling to his knees in relief. All of that, Kaloi, the officer said, still staring at him. Kaloi grimaced, his ears drooping again, and he pulled the coin purse from the other side of his tunic and passed it over. With a frown, Bradford stepped up against Kaloi, getting right into his personal space. Like the gate sentry, he was shorter than Ren, 
and she pushed her chest against his, making her mass difference abundantly clear. If you ever try and feck with Rin, or any of my marines ever again, she growled, locking her eyes onto his and committing his face and name to memory, I will fucking rip out your goddamn heart through your arsehole. Do you understand me? He gulped and nodded. His ears spat against his skull as he cowed back from her. The same goes for any of you, she said, sweeping her gaze over the crowd. Perhaps uh, I'm reaching the limit here, she thought. Probably time to cut and run. She was about to turn back to the officer and bid him adieu, but stopped dead as her eyes spun across the familiar, tawny, arrogantly noble face. They both froze as they made eye contact, and the bottom of her stomach dropped out. He was there the entire time. She saw Red. You son of a bitch! Radford drove headlong into the crowd after him, sending pikemen tumbling out of her way. He tried to evade her, but the crowd was packed too tight. Her hand grabbed his tunic, and she was already holding him back out of the crowd by the time Gomez and Kowalski waded in after her. They shoved Kishman away from her, ensuring that she had a clear path back. She dragged Lord Anyo into the open. You knew! She smashed her fist into the smug little face, still holding him by his tunic. You were there the entire time! She hauled back and slammed his face again. She felt something crack and she was pretty sure that it wasn't her fist. You were going to let him hang? She hauled up back again, but strong arms caught her, and she was pulled away. Released from her grasp, Anyo slumped to the ground as she struggled against the marines, screaming in rage. Barely held back, I'm gonna fucking kill you! Sergeant, Japs, Japs, you got him! Her chest heaved as red faded, and she slowly stopped straying against Kowalski and Gomez. Dubois was in front of her, desperately trying to get her to snap out of her blind rage. Their precarious situation came rushing back, and she realized just how close they could be to being completely fecked. She forced herself to relax, sagging a little, and Kowalski and Gomez released her. She took a deep breath and straightened, struggling to regain her composure. She took a cover off and ran a hand over her hair before squaring it back on her head. Professional. Gotta stay professional. But the fury still remained. Her eyes narrowed and she turned to face the officer. He remained seated on his drumhead, prim and proper and ramrod straight. His ears were perked, but he still held a tear cut, calmly in one hand. She could barely keep her whole body from trembling in rage. Is Lord Anyo the source of your tip, sir? He met her gaze evenly and said nothing, but the flick of his ears told her all she needed to know. She gave him a small nod and turned to a squad. Duar, Miller, take him. She nodded at Anya. Aye, Sergeant. They bent and picked up the unconscious Kishman between the two of them. I should probably say something imparting to that officer, but I don't trust myself to, uh, b- probably just best to go. Let's get back to base. She turned and led the squad out of the royal host camp. Now that the adrenaline was wearing off and her rage cooled, She had to struggle against the tremors and wanted to seize her whole body. Her right hand throbbed, and muscles that she didn't know she had ached, but she dared not show any of it. Geshman parted like a red sea before them. Once clear of the camp, they turned and she led them towards the supply trucks. Remind me never to piss her off, said Teddy muttered. She was only saying what needed saying, Brickle whispered. She was just a lot more aggressive about it, he shrugged. My ass was one of the ones S.H.I.E.L.D. saved. He's one of us, my books. Fuzzy tail or not. Bradford pretended not to hear them. Well, that could have gone worse, Dubois said, walking next to her. Huh, she snorted. Yeah. Well, at least it's over. She sighed, shaking her head. Nope, it's not. Still got to explain the chain of command why I just caused what will probably be a major diplomatic incident. She frowned, gesturing at Anyo's limp form, being dragged across the ground by two marines. Never mind uh, his attempted murder plot. Yeah, feck, he frowned as well. A black horde thundered overhead and they paused, watching it circle the camps inside the walls. Turning back to the road, they saw several Humvees heading their way. Look at that, the cavalry's here, Kowalski said. Late as usual, but still good to see. No, don't get too excited, Ravid said as she read the unit's insignias. It's a goddamn army. End of chapter. Just a quick shout out to the T5 peeps. 
Bob the Dragon, Cat Crab Lobster, Data Magnet, Dark Machine, Bezik, Try Again 95, Feudic Yol, Astraea the Dreamer, Caspar Arnholtz, Cam Maxwell, Athelia, Meridian 117, and Jordan Buxmorm. Thank you very much. And that, my friends, concludes this video. I hope that you enjoyed. There are links down below both to support this channel and for the author of this fiction. Anyways, I hope you all have a fantastic one, and I'll see you next time. Cheers.